What I find crazy is these Teslas and good cars that go through Hutongs. Very brave cars to go through these narrow alleys. As you can see, life is coming back. Life is coming back to Beijing in the Hutongs. Lots of people walking about. It's nice to see. All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Dominic, and I'm from Be Electric, which is an electric bicycle tour company here in Beijing. And we take our guests around our favorite spots in Beijing and teach them about the history and culture and have a fun time. And we recently started to do these online tours, so thank you to Rich, who are organizing these. Last time we went through the Hutongs, which is where we are now. And today, we're going to go down the central axis of Beijing. Um, but to start with, as we are starting in the Hutongs, for those of you that weren't here last time, the Hutongs are these alleyways that lots of Chinese residents and foreign residents live in Beijing. So more and more foreigners like myself can move into these hutongs because it is a pretty cool place to live and you can live amongst the locals which nine times out of ten are very friendly and welcome you into, into the city. I actually used to live in these hutongs. I used to live not too far down that way and this shop here on the right used to be my local. So when I missed a little bit from home this is actually a foreign imported supermarket called Chezala, if anyone here is French, they can correct my pronunciation, but it's a French shop. Lots of nice cheese, croissants, and lots of nice beers in here. So we're gonna head round through the Hutongs, and we're gonna go to the drum and bell towers. If you do have any questions along the way, please do drop us. No, you can't speak because you're muted, but you can type a message. And uh, <laughs> because they are very, very small hutal alleyways. So if a car comes through, especially a big boy like this, you often do have to wait for them to go past so we can go through. Ooh. They do us have to be very careful navigating through the hoot songs and it gets busier. Weather man for you today. It's pretty nice weather here in Beijing. We've got about 20, 22, 23 degrees Celsius. This is pretty nice. Not too hot just yet. Very beautiful time to be here. For those of you goats who didn't know, so the Hutongs, they used to be places where lots of nobles would have lived. So back at the beginning of the dynasties, Yuan dynasty and the beginning of the Ming dynasties, it would have been very important people living in the Hutongs. But as the dynasties went on, more and more population came in, more people got pushed into the Hutongs. So nowadays, there are thousands and thousands of people living in them. But I do apologize for the wind if it is a bit loud. It's a small journey to, to the drum bell towers. So before we get there, I'll tell you about the, the central axis. So this central axis in Beijing, um, it, so it's the center of Beijing, which most of the iconic and most of the important buildings are built along. So we have the drum and bell towers, which we're going to now, 
know, the Forbidden City, we have Jing Shan Park, we have Zhang Yanmen and Yongding. All of these very important buildings are built along this central axis of Beijing. And being the capital of Beijing in the center city, sorry, center country, it is the center of the world, this central axis. So it's a pretty important place that we're, we're heading to now. Okay, so just around the corner. Get ready to see and watch out for people coming past. So we had ahead of us the bell tower. Okay, just up there. But before that, it's pretty nice because this area is starting to be a bit more occupied, a bit busier. So you can see it's quite a social area. There's some kids or a kid and his, his dad playing badminton here. People are chilling over here on the exercise machines. This is quite a small exercise park with a, or four, six, six machines there to exercise on. It's quite common throughout Beijing, these outdoor exercise places uh, for people to come and, and or do a bit of exercise on. It's generally the older, older population that come down here. And that's how they keep so fit and generally live quite long. And then over the other side here, might be able to see over there. So there's lots of people playing either mahjong or some cards or some Chinese chess. So lots of locals who come down to play with their mates day and night. When it gets a bit later on, the beers come out. But it's always quite a fun place to come down to and, and chill with the locals and your friends. So something here, I can see, this is a very, very local thing to play. It's called Jianzi. Now, do you think I can play with them and play Jianzi? Oh, I can. Do you think I can play with them? Yeah. All right, you guys hold on a sec. Hello. I can play with them and play with them and play with them. Huh? So it's called Jianzi. It's like a, a shuttlecock mi mixed with a, a badminton. Let's see if they kick it over to me. I don't know where we will. So let's see what it is. It's like a badminton shuttlecock mixed with a hacky sack. I might just ruin that game. We can have a little couple of kicks. Nice. Hey! Nice. So I'm not embarrassing myself here. I've got a few kicks in. All right. Just yeah. Just yeah. Bye bye. Nice. So this is called Jianzi. And it's, it's one of the most common sports for people to come play in parks like this, which is awesome. And as you can see, it is quite uh, often to be an older people that come and play this. And they're absolutely pros. They've been playing this for probably 20, 30 years. So if you're good at football, good at soccer, you can come down and practice your skills playing Jianzi. All right. So we're going to head round now into the, into the courtyard between the big bell tower and the drum tower will be round the other side. It's a good example to show how friendly a lot of the locals are as well. So if it's awesome to play, play with you, most times they, they will say, yeah. Either because they want to have a bit of fun or they want to laugh at a foreigner being rubbish at the end of it. But fortunately, I didn't embarrass myself too much that time. So, uh, and what's great, oh, is it? It's great to see, especially for you guys, because this is the busiest this courtyard has been in a long time. So you can see life is coming back to Beijing. And lots of kids, 
Yeah, and people, there's some more people playing Genza over here. So yeah, it's a great place to come, day and night. So yeah, in the daytime, people will be playing some more games. There's people playing Genza over there again. Some longboarders here, some football. And then at night time, many of you will probably know, it's when the dancers come out. So the bell tower is not too far from Beilog Yuxiang. It's just down the road, a bit further west. It's about 200, 200 meters from, from Nanlog Yuxiang, so very close. So what we have, the bell tower and the drum tower. And they're at the northern end of this central axis. So it goes from south to north, and this is the old school northern end, ending with the bell tower. So we start with this guy. So it's actually the oldest out of the two. So built back in the Yuan Dynasty, and when the Mongols were ruling Beijing. And so it was originally used for time. So we'd have the, the bell going off in the morning. So sunrise, the bell would go off. And at dusk, at sunset, the, the drums would go off. And there's also actually a bit of a spooky story behind this bell tower. And it was actually when it was rebuilt. So it got burnt down twice. And then it got rebuilt in the Qing Dynasty. And when it was rebuilt by Qinglong, or his order to rebuild it, he gave this task to a group of people. He said, you have to build this tower and the biggest bell in Beijing before this date, or your heads are getting chopped off. So they felt the pressure, but they got to work trying to make the biggest bell in Beijing. And days went on, weeks went on, and it actually got to the day before the deadline date. And guess what? They still couldn't make this bell. They couldn't actually make the fire hot enough to make this bell. So they kind of gave up hope and they went to families and they said, look guys, I'm sorry. We tried our hardest, but we couldn't make it work. So tomorrow we've got to say goodbye. And then, then the daughter of the, the, main, the main engineer making the bell, they're a very spiritual individual. And they thought they could do something about this to, to help the fire get hot enough. So they went to the fire that evening. And can you guess what they did? If anyone can. They actually jumped in the fire. Believing it themselves and their strong spirit would make it hot enough. And did it work? I mean, you can't see the, the bell in there, but it is in there. So it did work. And myth has it to this day, when you hear the bell ring, it makes a sound that goes, xie, xie. And if anyone recognized what I just said, xie, xie means thank you. So there's two beliefs. One is that she's saying, thank you for sparing my father's life. And the second, there's a piece of clothing that is xie, which is shu. So the second is the belief that as she jumped in, someone tries to stop her and at the same time took off her shoe. So the second believer is saying, share, I think, give me back my shoe. So there are a few stories like this across Beijing. Always have a, a different story going on. Sorry. Uh, there's a few more people. Ben Jen's over here. What's great about the drum tower as well is you can actually see performances still going on. So back in the old days, there would have been many, many performances going on, the emperor. And to this day, there's lots still going on when the drum tower is actually open, which you guys can go and see. So on your visit to Beijing, <laughs> it's a must to come to this courtyard. A lot of the time as well, actually, they're selling these gens. So on the sides, there'll be people selling these gens that you can, you can buy for 10, like one pound, and then play with your mates after you get a bit of practice in playing with the pros. So we're gonna head down south on the central axis. Our next stop is the Fire God Temple. 
Hey, it's great. Thank you, man, for showing. You're welcome, man. No worries. So just before we go past that, year, it's quite a cool thing to, well, something you might have noticed in a lot of the old school buildings. You might see these wires all the way along the tops of the rooftops. And these wires are actually, they're like lightning rods. So there's been lots of fires in the past throughout the dynasties. And, and they think if they put these lightning rods on the rooftops, it'll kind of redirect the, the electricity to the ground and shouldn't shouldn't set the buildings alight. Yeah, this, this is a drum tower here, and we're just leaving even the bell tower behind us. Yeah. Top tip, ever come into Beijing, everyone you see just say ni hao. Whenever they look at you, Say anyhow, hello. I can get a nice reply back. I'm being a bit of a rebel going the wrong side of the road. It's only for a little bit to get over the other side. Oh, so it's ridden past a nice little wedding photo shoot, which is it's very common especially next to drum towers, especially next to red backgrounds like this, which I guess red the good luck for prosperity and, and our booming life. So a lot of the time, it's good to have this sort of background. Often go to the Great Wall, of course, as well. And if you're super rich, you'll travel to uh, wonders of the world, so like the Eiffel Tower and the pyramids and get all sorts of photos uh, in front of these attractions. And then at your wedding, you'll have a, a big PowerPoint presentation showing all these photos to, to all, of your, all of your guests. That's beautiful. There you go. Hey, he's doing that just for us. Just share. Uh, you remember, Carl, yeah? <laughs> You're welcome. Nice. Right, speaks English. Right, so this is still at the northern end of the, of the central axis. Got the drum tower behind us. Nice, beautiful landscape view of the drum tower. I'm going to head straight down, straight down south. So as in, I mean, pretty much any city in the world, when you have a big attraction, there's lots of shops or souvenir shops and, and things to buy close by. So the street just south of the drum tower, there's, there's lots of things to, to buy, especially in, in these hutongs here, which someone just said when you're Hohai, correct? And this hutong goes straight into Hohai. It's a very famous, shop, another shopping street, like that Nogu Xiang down the road. Got some nice souvenirs down down in the sweet song. Paris baguette is becoming increasingly popular over here. Which I'm not French, but I think they do pretty good baguette. Probably not as good as Paris, but still pretty good. What you may notice as well, it's pretty amazing in Beijing, uh, the cycle lanes. So right here, I'm completely separated from the road. So it's normally pretty safe to, to ride along here. You've got to have wee wits about you, but at least we're separated from the cars, which is nice. Okay, so we're just coming up to, if you remember what I said earlier, that famous temple here. 
Now pull him to the right. He's here. Nice. Okay, so what we have here, we have, well, firstly, how many people are, how many people are on at the moment? But is anyone studying Chinese? And can anyone recognize any of the characters there? The middle one's probably um, the easiest one to recognize. No? Okay, so the middle is Kua, which is fire. So this is the fire god temple. And it's quite a unique temple in Beijing for, for being one of the only temples with these yellow roofs as well. So it's got yellow glazed roofs. And the reason it has yellow glazed roofs is because in the Qing Dynasty, when they're being plagued with lots of fires, the, the emperor thought if they bless this temple with yellow roofs, which by the way, yellow roofs uh, are normally reserved for royals, an important imperial people. So if they gave the fire god temple these yellow roofs, then perhaps these fires would stop. Not sure if it is, but we can try. So another thing about this temple as well, what they put on the doors, so these studs, you see these studs that go along? There's actually nine studs that go along, horizontally and then diagonally. And normally that is also reserved for, for the Imperials. There's nine being also the, the highest uh, single digit number. It's also, if you guys know the word for nine, Jill, and also sounds like the word for long, so long life and prosperity and good life. Another thing, if you guys were on the last Hutong tour, you recognize these barriers at the bottom of the doorway. So these barriers are to stop ghosts. So these are to stop, sorry, not just any ghosts, bad ghosts from getting into temples or houses. Because if you're a bad ghost, it means you've done bad things in your life. And in the afterlife, you have your knees taken away. So you can't step and you can't jump. So these barriers that you'll see in lots of temples and lots of houses, uh, as opposed to stop these bad, bad ghosts from getting in. So it's a very beautiful temple to come to, and it is normally open. So when things completely open up in Beijing, you can go inside and, and check it out. I'm going to go a little bit down the road. It links on to Shanghai. As so, so someone said earlier, Hohai. And Shanghai is its partnering bro. Nice. Here we are. You guys can probably see the beautiful setting, especially today. Some nice clouds in the sky. But what we have here, so this is Shanghai. And it's right next to Hohai. There's the three lakes, Shanghai, Hohai, and Shihai. They're all part of Shi Chahai, which literally means the lake of 10 temples, because it did have lots of temples, including this one here. Uh, along uh, the temple. Someone said, is it hot? It's not too hot. It's a very nice temperature. So it's about 23 degrees at the moment. You can see people fishing down here as well. So it's a very common thing to do is come and fish down here. Another thing to do for the locals, and if you want to get involved, you, you can, is come and swim here. Nice, yeah, sure, ciao, hi. So you can come and swim in this lake. Although around the outside, it does say no swimming, no fishing and no climbing. Yeah, it's a very common thing, especially for locals to do. Yeah, really to swim. So in the summer, when it opens up, hopefully in a month or, or maybe 
this month. You can come and swim in here. And even in the winter, so in the winter, if you guys have been in Beijing, you know how cold it gets. All of this water freezes over in the winter. But there's some parts of the lake that people will actually come and hack out the ice in the morning. So there's a certain area that will be open and you can jump in and do an ice dip. So if you're brave enough or stupid enough like me, you can go and do an ice swim, which is a very revitalizing thing to do, especially with the locals. You can kind of challenge yourself to see if you can last as long as them in the freezing cold water. And I guarantee you, you won't be able to last as long as them. Some of the locals last six minutes in the water. I timed one of them last time. And I'm about 30 second guy in the water, unfortunately. So I'm going to keep, keep heading down south. And yes, yeah, so someone said we can ice skate here in the winter. So yeah, correct. You also ice skate around this whole lake. The other side of the bridge it'll be open it'll be open and there'll be barriers sectioning it off so different sections of ice skating and you can also get those sledges that you go along with as well if you're not too good at ice skating so we're going to keep heading down south get down to Jingshan Park quite a cool thing that I like I'm just going to see this on the side and just throw it so just these things on the side of the road there's always a dude just on the side of the road that can can help you fix your bike out this guy here so if you want to drop along and help you fix your bike so now what do you can yeah what's your this yeah so there's a, a fixing your bike so there's a key maker here as well this guy's helping fix a blanket over here So again, normally very pretty, pretty nice people and very cheap. You can come come along and get your get your stuff fixed. So I don't know if you guys can see in the distance, you may be able to see the, the peak of Jingshan Park to the top pavilion. By the way, I forgot to tell you guys before, but so this central axis, it goes, the original central axis goes 7.8 kilometers. We're doing half of it today. Um, but now to modern day, it actually stretches uh, a lot more kilometers up north because they've put the Olympic Park all the way up north, which is also the center. So they've made a modern, modern addition to, to the central axis. On the left and right here, these uh, military houses. So, military personnel and their families would live in these houses on the left and right. And as we, we approach Jingshan and Forbidden City, this is where it gets, yeah, so strict security, some of this posted military houses. But this is where it does get a bit more um, secure. As we go around the corner, you may see a few more army men or security personnel. Generally, just to the north side of Forbidden City, it's okay. 
And then if you go a bit further south, is when you go to Tiananmen Square. It's where you see lots of army personnel marching around. Which uh, also normally pretty cool. You can normally wave at them, try and get them out of position, but it's quite cool to see. Think if we look up to the left, you can also see that so the top pavilion, yeah, nice John. Like the comments, nice green trees around, exactly. So, this is yeah, it's one of the nicest times of the year to come down, down to Beijing when it's not too hot. Nice green trees, especially on these, these roadways along Bingtown Park and the Forbidden City. I think you guys can just about see. So up here, this is the top pavilion at Jingshan Park. Very famous park in Beijing. So this top bit here is the, the highest natural point, kind of natural in Beijing, to, to be able to see across, especially the best point to see the Forbidden City. Which is where we're heading to now. So on the right here is Dagashuan Hall, which uh, was the entrance to the Imperial Taoist Taoist Temple. So it was the only one that the emperor could actually go to safely and just across from the Forbidden City. You can already see lots of people on the corner of this part of the Twin City. Quite a popular place to come and, and view the northwest corner in this watchtower. So down down this way over here, that's where it starts to get a bit more strict. That's straight down towards uh, Tiananmen Square on the west side of the Bin City. What's that, sorry, John? Then we can we'll cross over. Yes, yeah, so there are often a huge lineup of people waiting towards the bus. Right, I'm 
Let me go. Uh, got the green man. Up. So as you can see already, there are lots of people along this corner with all their cameras. This is a very popular place to come and see the Forbidden City. And it's a beautiful day, you can actually see the reflection, which is nice. And lots of you probably know. The Forbidden City, the home to the emperors. So it's been the home to 24 emperors across the Ming and Qing dynasty. There's actually 720 square meters, which is pretty nuts. And I've been in here about five times and I still haven't seen everything. So there's so much to see in the Forbidden City. It's actually now been named a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is pretty cool. And it has reopened now, so us guys in Beijing, we can go inside to the Forbidden City. There's less numbers that can go in, but we can still go inside. So I know we spoke about Jingshan Park, which is just north of the city. So Jingshan Park, it was actually made with the mud from this moat. So you see this big moat? going around the Forbidden City. All of the muds from here and the foundations of the Forbidden City were chucked over the other side of the road to make these big mounds of Jingshan Park. And it's also quite a famous park for a bit of a spooky story as well, or gruesome story of the, the last Ming Emperor, Chong Zheng, who hung himself in Jingshan Park. So up on the pavilion, he ran and hung himself because when these rebels came along and they burst in the entrance of the Forbidden City, he didn't want to be captured by these rebels. I mean, who would? So he ran up to Jingshan Park and, and took his life so that they couldn't capture him. But on that note, it's a nice place to end the, the 40 minute tour. And you can actually see over to modern Beijing. So just over there, it's the tallest building in Beijing now. It's called China Zun. It's actually named after, so Zun is a, it's an old artifact, it's like a vase. They used to drink out of it and it's shaped, goes in and out on both sides. And this is meant to be shaped like a, like a Zun. Yeah, if you do have any questions at the end, um, please do feel free to, to message below. Thank you for listening in. Thank you, Rich. I'm looking forward to the next one.